All right. Well, um, if everyone who is uh, joining us wants to kind of come back in together and we will get started with our last panel of the day and it's on the experiential curriculum in a new era and and i think that this is a a fun yet difficult topic and as tracy and i were talking about the book this was one that we wanted to be sure that we covered I know when the pandemic hit in March of 2020, and, and Suzy, since we work together, can attest to this, I thought, oh, the con law class that I'm teaching to my 1Ls, that's easy, right? I can get on Zoom and lecture, but the moot court competition that I'm running, like, what am I going to do with that? But as we heard, for those of you who've been on all day, as we heard from the first panel with Judge Miskell and uh, Judge Dillard and the other panelists, some amount of online, you know, law practice is here to stay. So <clears throat> teaching our students to perform these skills online um, in a new digital era is, is very important. So to that end, um, the Cooley faculty has been stepping up to be moderators. And so Chris has volunteered, Chris Church from Cooley has volunteered to be our moderator. Um, I'm going to turn things over to her. And Chris, I can help monitor the Q&A for you too. Okay, thanks very much, Tessa. Let's um, throw this up there so everybody can see it. Um, <clears throat> so welcome to the last session of the day. Uh, we're gonna try and keep this very exciting and moving right along. We are all uh, professors that have taught simulation slash skills slash externs slash clinics um, and have been doing it online now for some time. And uh, just like Tessa was saying, none of us were used to doing this online. This is, there, there are some courses that might, you know, might lend themselves well to teaching online. But, uh, and I can tell you within the last year, I've taught appellate advocacy, I've taught trial skills, I've taught interviewing and counseling. So it's just been really interesting to see all of the um, techniques that are available out there for our students. And so what we've prepared for you today is really um, five separate uh, big ideas. Um, most of them come from the chapters that we've written in the book. Some of them, we have sort of collaborated on them. And so what we're going to do is run through these, spend about seven minutes each. But here's what I'd really like you to do. Because this is the last session of the day, I want to make this a little bit more interactive. So on the Q&A, if as we're talking about one of these concepts, you have an idea as how something that you've learned, something that you've done that you want to share, put it in the Q&A. And then at the end, we're going to go through um, anything that our participants have added. There is a lot of wisdom in this virtual room. It's not just us, right, that has these ideas. And then at the very end, I'm going to provide you with the email addresses for each of the, um, um, the presenters so that if you have any questions about that particular topic, you can email the presenter. So let's just jump right into it. Um, I want to introduce Melina Healy from Turo. Uh, she's going to talk about virtual and collaboration technology in a clinic. Go ahead, and I'm going to stop sharing. Okay, I think this is the best that I can do with my slides at the moment, for which I apologize, but it's great to see everyone this afternoon. Um, I have really enjoyed this conference. Many of the presenters have talked about uh, home and the challenges of being at home for us and for our students. And so I wanna talk a little bit about how can an in-house clinic move beyond the physical space of your clinic home and for me, one of the major lessons of the past 18 months is that we can really harness technology to enlarge our community. Those who we serve as clients, those who we educate as students, and those with whom we collaborate in in-house clinics. So before I proceed with my seven minutes, um, what is an in-house clinic? 
uh, very basically, it's that students work directly with clients and that casework is supervised exclusively by clinic faculty. So the cases belong to and within the law school. Um, and so for those of us at Toro, our in-house clinic is a very community-based physical space on campus. And you'll see on the left-hand side of the screen, this is our beautiful uh, office building in Central Islip on Long Island. We have thousands of clients a year. Um, and some folks walk in without an appointment looking for assistance. We're right across the street from the state and federal courthouses. Um, many of our clinics hold weekly local library sessions. But of course, all of that ended on March 17th of 2020. Uh, and I talk a little bit in my chapter about how on that same day, I had to hit the road with my two little kids and stay away from my own home for five months because my husband uh, was redeployed to work in his hospital's COVID ICU. And so you see on the right here, I've done Draper style, added a family photo to my presentation. Um, because I, this just was a, such a tumultuous time for all of us. And I couldn't be in my personal home or my clinic home. And so what did we get out of that? Well, I actually think this was an opportunity to really distill those um, moments of personal connection and the ways that physical space that we share with people is important. And those things that really could have warranted a revolution that we really could harness technology to change and to make more inviting to people who we can't necessarily include in our physical space. So um, in clinic, what did we do beyond the physical space during these, this past year that um, really worked well? I have some examples here that I draw out of the chapter, but basically we brought folks in who into our virtual world who we couldn't bring into uh, our physical world. Um, so one of the examples here is our senior citizens and youth justice clinic, my clinic, took opposing sides in a virtual simulated trial. And we had former senior and youth clients come in and serve as our jury. We couldn't have done that in our physical space necessarily. We couldn't have had all those folks come together. So this picture here is a screenshot from that wonderful experience that we had. And I was struck with the first panel on, on practice and all the judges we heard from talking about some of the access to justice issues um, and can we get a more representative jury pool by, by including technology in the courtroom and allowing people to access the courtroom virtually. Those were things we grappled with in clinic on sort of an incubator scale. And so we thought, we thought through as, as advocates, what do we do to ensure that there is equity of access to technology and how do we make this a better experience for folks who might not otherwise be able to participate in the system. Um, we also, I heard this from other panels too, which was great, brought in guest speakers from across the country who we wouldn't have been able to bring into our class. Um, but we brought them in, in in my clinic to be sort of consulting guest experts on our cases. And um, we also do a sort of a medical legal partnership model. So some of our clients, um, their mental health providers were able to come to meetings with us and the clients to help think through some of the things we needed for our litigation strategy. Uh, we also, in my clinic, which is an education uh, advocacy-based clinic, were able to do interclinic case rounds with lots of other education advocacy clinics across the country. Um, and that's um, typically done in a very intimate setting within clinic, just on, on the cases that the clinic is handling. But we got to identify with those other clinics um, shared patterns and injustices in the system that we wanted to address collaboratively. And that was also great. Um, another thing that we did during the pandemic was to de develop new clinics that really were better able to serve our part-time and evening students and those folks with childcare responsibilities um, and who couldn't work during business hours. And we expanded, we have a mediation clinic that's virtual. Uh, we have a, um, a new post-conviction version of our criminal defense clinic that serves people off hours. Um, and so not only were we able to expand the types of students we could work with in clinic, also our client community, uh, we were able to expand that as well. But with all of these major advantages that we explored with clinic, 
Um, we also encountered quite a few challenges that I'm sure other clinicians and, and folks in practice also experienced in all of us. Um, and one was that uh, we had a lot of clients, way more than ever before, who ghosted us. So um, this is a term for those of you who aren't familiar with um, that millennials coined probably for the dating world more than anything else, but it's basically someone who cuts off communication with uh, another person without any warning or explanation, and then ignores any attempt to re-engage. And we've really experienced this a lot this year. And, and I think a lot of people attribute it to sort of there's, there's less empathy built into the social and cultural ties that we build over technology. Um, and so what, what I did was really have to work with my clinic students to engage with what are we going to do to address this. And, and I talk in the chapter of some of the strategies that we came up with, but really what I found most valuable was hearing from them about what they thought were the most important times in our representation to bring our clients in in person. Um, and so... So there were, there were some moments like, when, when is it important for you to see your client's face, see their classroom? If you're doing education advocacy, I also do prison work. Is it important for folks to see uh, the relentless dehumanization of a prison setting for our clients in order to adequately represent them? And when do we need to just, if, if there's a, a pandemic going on, when do we need to meet our clients somewhere outside in order to reestablish that connection and avoid this, this sort of um, traumatic experience of ghosting. So I think my seven minutes are up um, and I'm really looking forward to the other panelists and to hearing in the in the Q&A some of your ideas for what to do. Okay, well, thank you, Melita. Um, I appreciate that. And um, right now I don't see any um, information in the uh, question and answer. So we're gonna just move into our next um, uh, big idea, which is community building in online experiential learning. And that is with um, Emma Sokoloff-Rubin from Yale Law School. Emma, take it away. So I run a clinic at Yale Law School or co-run called the San Francisco Affirmative Litigation Project. It's a local government law clinic where we partner with the San Francisco City Attorney's Office and students work on developing and litigating cutting edge public interest cases. So aspects of our clinic have been a cross country partnership for 15 years in that a lot of our, our deputy city attorney legal supervisors are in San Francisco and our students are in New Haven. Um, but ordinarily we are all together, um, my co-teacher and I in the classroom um, in our clinic seminar are meeting with students, doing um, social events and things like that to build the kind of warm commun clinic community that supports the work. So for us, the, the big shift with COVID was thinking about how do we build community online? And um, I, I don't think I need to explain why community matters so much, but I'll, I'll just say, I mean, I think clinic work can be really challenging and really demanding, as, as you all know, and it's the, the ties between students that I think sustain that works so well. So we didn't know going in what that would look like. How would we create those kinds of connections when there wasn't the opportunity for informal conversation in between meetings, supervision meetings, or kind of talking after seminar and things like that. So three main takeaways in my seven minutes. One is that icebreakers actually work. I have been a big believer in icebreakers forever. Not everyone has been. My co-teacher was not into it, but uh, COVID came along and um, showed us how valuable they can be. Um, so that's what I'm mostly going to focus on. Um, I think it seems like a small thing, but actually I think really transformed our clinic this year. Um, then I'm going to talk briefly about how the Zoom chat can be a, a key pedagogical tool. That's something I, I feel like I have some thoughts about, but haven't fully developed in my own teaching practice. So I'm excited to hear from others. And then the others and thoughts about online social events. So why icebreakers? Um, so first of all, icebreaker is essentially just an opening question. I actually, over the course of the semester, started calling them openers rather than icebreakers because sometimes we think about icebreakers as a, something you use, say, the first time you meet new people. And I actually used an icebreaker or an opener every class meeting throughout the semester. So even students who've been working together for three months, we still use them. So I think icebreakers can build connection and community. They 
kind of provide a chance for inside jokes, for knowing a little bit about people beyond the bounds of their their legal practice, um, and an opportunity just to feel like you're kind of you're all in it together. So uh, after sharing some about the icebreakers that I had used early on in the semester at a clinical faculty meeting, and others shared as well, um, someone wrote to, uh, later in the semester when asked kind of what were some new things that she did in her clinic that semester, she talked about icebreakers. And she said that they really helped build connection and that the students ended up asking. So one of the icebreakers was what is your smallest problem today, which is one of my favorites because it's a great way of acknowledging that the little stuff affects us, even as it feels like the world is falling apart. Um, and also you, it just gives you a window into what someone's day looked like. Like did, did it start with without coffee? Did they have to put water in their cereal because they didn't have any milk? Um, is their window shade not working? Things like that. So she said that actually the students ended up following up and brainstorming solutions for each other's smallest problems. So one student's problem was they couldn't come up with a good paper topic for their legal philosophy class. So the whole group brainstormed it. Another was that her fish bowl broke. And so she showed them her fish in a plastic cup. And then the next week they got to see the new glass container. Um, so things like that. But then she also said that this turned into a launching pad for talking about the things that, that bring them happiness and joy. The other reason I think icebreakers are really valuable is that if everyone talks at the start of the class, I found that it leads to more participation throughout the class. So my classes are uh, on, on local government law. So we might be discussing themes about federalism or something else. And having gone around and shared their most favorite meal or their smallest problem today or something like that, I have found makes students who are less likely to speak up feel more inclined to just because they've they've literally unmuted themselves and use their voices. And I just think that that sort of breaks something of a wall. Um, and that's actually something that comes up in medical literature as well. A medical study that Atul Gawande writes about in one of his books, it calls this the activation phenomena. And basically they found that if everyone in the room performing a surgery speaks up um, and says their name at the start of a surgery, that the results improve because people are more likely even like people lowest on the totem pole are more likely to jump in and correct an error or voice a concern, um, or in our case, share an idea um, if they've opened their mouths already. So I'm gonna share some of my favorite icebreakers. And if anyone in the chat would like to share one that you like, this it, I would love to hear them and maybe Christine can read them out to us. So the first one of our semester, we did places you claim. We started with where you're from, but a lot of students, of course, are from, and people are from many places. And so one of my students started talking about different places that she claimed based on where her family was from, where she had lived at different times in her life. Um, some students feel like, well, I grew up here, but I claim this place I went to college, or I claim the place that I lived when I was born, even if I then moved somewhere else. So it changed over the course of time to places you claim most memorable meal, your smallest problem today. Um, there was a, a loss of a student in our school community and a really heartbreaking time. And we talked about something that brings you comfort and then the most surprising job you've ever had. So I just wanna share a couple of ideas for making icebreakers effective. One is to give a heads up. So at the start of a class, I'll, students know to expect that I'm gonna do some kind of icebreaker or opener, but I'll actually say what it is. And, or sorry, I'll first say, okay, I'm gonna call on Rachel first, just so Rachel has a heads up. And then I'll ask the question so that Rachel has time to think for a moment. And then I will go first, just to buy a little bit more time for everyone to think about their answers. Everyone participates. So professors, guests, I would sometimes, when we had guest speakers, which was something we could do very easily uh, being on Zoom, I would actually tailor the icebreaker to their interests. So we had a guest who was a real foodie. So we did that. Um, someone else who said, oh, I don't, I don't like icebreakers. And they said, okay, well, what do you like to do? And they shared a hobby that I was able to create an icebreaker around. Um, and that is also equalizing. Like, it's not, it's not like, oh, well, I'm the, I'm the teacher and I'm going to have you all build community. It's I'm the, I'm part of this community. We're all learning together and icebreakers are a way to share uh, something about ourselves in a way that still maintains, you know, professional boundaries. Um, and then just as a small, but logistical thing, that's really helpful rather than pausing to call out people's names um, throughout get, using icebreakers, I'll just build out the cue in the chat. So I'll call on Rachel say first, and then once as Rachel's talking, I'll type in other people's names. And so we would just rotate through that way. Um, and, and another point on time, I, I really built time into this. I would expect to spend a solid 20 minutes on icebreakers. Um, you can calibrate the icebreaker based on how much time you have. I actually increased the amount of class time we had last fall, knowing that I, I, I wanted to build into class um, stuff that would usually happen, you know, if we went out for pizza afterward as a clinic or just in casual conversations during the break. 
So then a meta icebreaker, my favorite last class icebreaker was share an idea for an icebreaker. Um, and so one student suggested, what's the right way to unpack groceries, your dream job at age five, your favorite cheese or spread or fandom level obsession. So these are icebreakers I plan to use next year. And I've also heard of clinicians who will have a different student be responsible for coming with the icebreaker each week. So that's another option to have it be student led. So shifting to using the Zoom chat, um, and again, this is something I, I'm just developing, but I was not at the start of things thinking that the Zoom chat would be particularly useful. I imagined it being more of a distracting side conversation. And I actually found the opposite. I found that it's a great opportunity for essentially for multiple people to get to talk and engage at once. Um, so students, I would model using it to voice agreement, enthusiasm, hesitations. I would try to use it myself early on in the class and to say to students, like, you're welcome to use this to um, share a link or some other other idea connected to it to say you have a question. Um, I also used it to provide additional context and ideas, particularly newer students in the clinic, because my clinic has 1Ls through 3Ls. So some students are in their fourth semester in the clinic when others are in their first. Um, I, I would invite them always to send me a private message with a question, and then I would answer it for the whole class. Um, so it allowed me to explain key terms that I might not have interrupted say a guest speaker to explain what a particular acronym stood for, but I could do so in the chat. And then the other thing that I found really successful was encouraging participation via private message. So students who had not participated in a long time or who had shared with me that they were hesitant to speak up, I would often um, send them a private message when a moment came that it, I asked students to share written reflections in advance of class, just like a sentence or two of their thoughts on the reading. So I could actually think about, oh, you know what, Zach's comment would actually fit in really well here. And then I could send him a message saying, hey, no pressure, but if you wanted to speak up, I'd love for you to share this idea that you already wrote about. Um, or similarly, if someone's, but whenever someone spoke for the first time in the seminar, um, you know, the first time that semester, I would send them a private message just saying like, it's great to hear your perspective. Thanks for sharing that. And I, I think that that made a really big difference and hopefully kind of quieted that voice that I know many of us have in our heads after we speak up of like, was that dumb? Did that make sense? Did people understand what I was saying? So I found that to be a really useful tool. And I'm kind of thinking, well, when I'm back in person, what are ways of doing that when there isn't the option of a private chat? Finally, um, virtual social events. So I have two student directors in the clinic who are students who are returning to the clinic, um, but are, are still students and can kind of keep a finger on the pulse of things. And they shared with me that they really felt like students were pretty zoomed out and that it didn't make sense to do as many social events as we might have um, in person. So that's where my takeaway being less is more, um, but that it is worthwhile to do some. And we did things that actually were particularly well suited to Zoom. So um, we, Heather Girk and my uh, co-teacher taught a, a cooking class. Um, so you can see her in her kitchen, everyone else is in their kitchen. That's the kind of thing that actually wouldn't have worked really well in person, but it worked well um, online and people's roommates and friends could join as well. Um, I found that it's really helpful to acknowledge the inevitable awkwardness, like to say, it's kind of weird that we're having a party on Zoom because normally you don't really go to the, <laughs> this is not what a party is like, or we did breakout rooms for mingling. And I just said like, well, this is weird. I'm just going to pop around to different uh, breakout rooms and you can just pretend I'm kind of jumping into your conversation to say hi. And similarly, when um, Heather and I were kind of talking what would normally be might have figured out during a seminar with just kind of a glance at each other, like, should we take the break now? Should we shift to this or whatever it was? We would have to do out loud because we were on Zoom and we just acknowledged that, like, we're going to kind of figure this out out loud. And I found that that really helped because instead of feeling like the awkwardness was standing in between all of us, it was kind of like, well, we're all in this together, trying to have a meaningful community class or social event, uh, despite the limitations of Zoom. So I'll stop there because I know other panelists have a lot to share, um, but I'm excited to hear any ideas you have for icebreakers or anything else. So um, some of the panelists have add, added some interesting um, topics, which is uh, Susie has said, um, what's making you happy this week? And I think that's a nice one. Um, mine, it was very similar that I use in my classes. What do you do that brings you joy? Because that's always followed up with, are you still doing it? Or have you stopped because you're in law school? <laughs> so, all right, well, thanks, um, Emma, I appreciate that. We're gonna jump to the third one, um, which is me um, talking about effective feedback. And it's effective feedback in online classes. So. You know, we all know that um, 
uh, standard 304 uh, requires whether you're doing a, um, a clinic or you're doing an externship or you're doing a skills class simulation class that you have to have multiple opportunities for performance and lawyering skills with faculty feedback. We also are required to have some student self evaluation. Um, and as a side note, this is not my chapter in the book. My chapter in the book is backwards design for a simulation class so that you can demonstrate compliance with standard 304. So it sort of ties in, but it's a little bit different. Um, you know, when, when we are uh, talking about faculty feedback, there's so much information out there when it comes to um, how to give feedback that's effective. How do you, um, um, you know, word things correctly where good job just doesn't do it, right? We need to have effective feedback. And there are a lot of models out, out there for when it comes to effective feedback of lawyering skills um, performance. But, um, and, and some of those are, for example, the NIDA model where you talk about you did this really well, and then here's where you could do better. Um, we also use rubrics a lot um, as a way to give feedback. But what I really wanna talk about is feedback should be immediate. Feedback should be individualized to the student and it should be very specific. And so when you're giving the feedback, you wanna play back what did the student do and then give some um, um, constructive uh, tips on how the student could do it better. So first of all, in an online environment, you have got to talk about it in the classroom. You have to talk about constructive criticism and what it is and why you're going to do it and how not to mix up um, constructive criticism with personal criticism because some of our students take it a little too personally. Uh, and we wanna make sure that they know I'm trying to help you be a better lawyer. And that's the purpose. And if you talk about that in the class, before you engage in the first feedback session, you're gonna find that your students are far more receptive uh, to getting that kind of feedback. We have, as a faculty, really gotten used to using our video technology for us to make videos on the substantive topics that we wanna cover so that our students can watch it after the class, before the class. So we've gotten familiar with that video technology. What I wanna do is to encourage you to use the video uh, as a way to provide feedback. And I've put up this picture here so you can sort of see our particular, um, um, uh, our particular type of uh, video that we use where we can give feedback. We are a school that uses Canvas. Um, there's a tool within Canvas called Studio. And so I use Studio to make videos for my students all of the time. But I've also been using Studio for my students' performance videos. This is an example of uh, an interview that was taking place. And when I play back the video, I have now videoed my students' performance. When I'm watching that video, and by the way, I can watch it at one and a half speed, sometimes double speed, because I, I've, I've already seen it. So I can do it much faster, but I can pause and put a comment. And what you're seeing in this picture is a timeline. And every time you see a blue circle, that's a comment that's feedback on my student's performance. So I can say things like, um, if, if I'm in interviewing and counseling, um, pause, comment, look at your face right now. You are really showing judgment of the client, right? Um, in trial skills, we would uh, videotape direct examinations and I would pause the video and I would say, that's a compound question. 
listen to it again. But it's right there. It's immediate, and they can see that. If you don't have this particular tool, what you do have is um, time uh, markers. So you can say, at 3 minutes and 37 seconds, here's my feedback. So they can go back and they can watch their video. They can see their own performance, which then gives them the opportunity for self-evaluation. Self but they can um, see your comment and pause the video at that point in time and see exactly what they just did that generated the feedback that you were um, giving them. So um, this, is, this is my one, my one big idea is just the idea of real time type feedback um, using video for uh, experiential learning. The other thing that I'll add to this too is that I use video when I do breakout rooms. Um, so for example, I'll have my students going to breakout rooms in small groups where they're going to process with each other and practice with each other before they practice in a fishbowl environment in front of the whole class. Um, and what I have learned is I set up these rooms so that they can record them and I can watch uh, their practices because what that does is it gives them some accountability uh, that in that breakout time, they're not just fooling around, right? And they are actually um, doing some um, performances. So that's my big idea. Um, I'm going to move on to our next speaker here. And this is on training students to be effective online advocates, which is definitely going to be something in the future that is um, a, a very important lawyering skill. Susie Salmon from the University of Arizona, James E. Rogers College of Law. Um, it's your time. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so I'm gonna, you're gonna hear me echoing a lot of things that you've already heard, um, but that's probably good. So my big takeaway is, or my big idea is we need to seize the opportunity uh, that's presented by this shift to online virtual advocacy to rethink, revisit, and re-envision how we teach oral advocacy in general. Um, so as we heard from folks on the first panel, um, virtual oral advocacy is here to stay, uh, at least to some extent, even before for the spring of 2020. Uh, some courts were moving uh, some routine hearings online and certainly ADR uh, proceedings have moved largely online because of the cost savings uh, that ADR is supposed to um, help create. Uh, so whether we uh, do small online oral argument exercises in a 1L class or send a team to a interscholastic competition, we should be preserving those opportunities. I know it's tempting with um, the litigation heavy focus of the first year um, to look at, and especially because you know, many of our students are never going to be litigators, and even those who are, are never going to deliver an oral argument. So it's really tempting to eliminate that from the curriculum. Um, but I would argue that uh, now more than ever, we want to keep that in the curriculum. Um, there are versions of the role-playing uh, simulation that, that Ann Nowak talked about. It's a great opportunity for professional identity formation, something law schools traditionally struggle to teach, um, and for students to find their voices as advocates and as professionals. Um, um, it's, it's the first time they really feel like a real lawyer in law school is when they get up there and they deliver that oral argument. Um, people in our first panel, I, I think Katie Biber and Judge Diller talked about how adaptability and creativity in the face of adversity are essential lawyering skills. Well, oral argument teaches adaptability to be certain. Um, when you're pivoting to respond to um, unanticipated concerns from judges, you need that kind of flexibility, um, the nimble thinking, the ability to pivot from a planned line of argument um, to address. It teaches you to disagree with civility, uh, which we've talked about as being a concern, um, critical thinking, professional judgment. Each time I turn back to this topic, I think of new reasons why we need to keep oral advocacy in the curriculum. Um, I ran into uh, a new uh, idea. Professor Tori Randall, actually, I think uh, one of Christine's colleagues, um, spoke at the Allwood Conference about using advocacy to teach women to uh, do business development. Uh, 
Um, so there are lots of opportunities. So two things I want to encourage people to take advantage of. Opportunities to enhance diversity and inclusion, which many of our panelists have talked about, by rethinking the style and demeanor that we privilege in advocacy and the online environment creates great opportunities for that. And then also um, briefly opportunities to enrich the educational experience by taking advantages of the, the virtual environment. Katie Biber talked about how moving work to the virtual environment presented her opportunities to enhance diversity and inclusion in hiring. Um, the virtual environment presents some of those same opportunities. Um, moot court in legal education goes back to at least uh, 16th century England, um, but the traits and techniques many so-called uh, oral argument best practices foster go back even earlier uh, to classical Greece and Rome. Uh, classical Greece and Rome, which PS is a time when only elite white males and usually just elite white male warriors were allowed to speak in the public arena. Um, so many of the conventions of modern oral advocacy, even in the 2020s, still derive from the values of a time when the quote, quote unquote warrior stance, uh, I think uh, the booming voice and the commanding physique, I think uh, Katie Byer talked about table pounding and loud voices, right? Which um, the virtual environment no longer privileges. Um, and so we should take advantage of that. Um, and, and in saying that's not no longer how you uh, are persuasive or communicate credibility. Um, you know, and, and it was it derives from a time when women who advocated in a public forum were considered, um, they use words like unnatural, unwomanly, and shrill. Um, and again, um, as I'm sitting here, as we're all, I think, sitting here, um, we see that um, the presentation style in the virtual environment is very different. None of us are standing at podia, for example. Um, you know, we're not gesturing, we're not um, being really um, large and dramatic or loud. Um, you know, we're all being very low key, very reasoned, very conversational, um, which is definitely a style that we could privilege. Um, also, when arguments moved online, uh, you know, we had some panelists who uh, I think Trisha Martin and Susan Landrum in particular talked about how before the pandemic, um, you know, people with disabilities were told that certain accommodations just weren't possible. And of course, those are accommodations we're now making routinely. For example, um, having to stand to argue, which um, is very um, difficult difficult for people with mobility impairments um, uh, all, all along the spectrum, um, from people who can't physically stand for, to people who, for whom it is difficult to stand. Um, and then as uh, David Lapp pointed out, everyone has the same size box on Zoom. Um, which removes some of the subjective advantages of, you know, height and, and other sort of physical communications of, of that sort of warrior um, ethos uh, that used to be privileged. Um, you're not projecting to fill a cavernous courtroom, right? You're, you're, in fact, that kind of projection can be kind of off-putting and not persuasive in the Zoom environment because it's so overwhelming. And then finally, uh, I want to encourage people to take advantage of the virtual environment um, you know, in ways that, that, that Melina and Christine just talked about. Um, bring in judges from elsewhere. Um, I know Tessa had two Ninth Circuit judges and a Fifth Circuit judge on our final panel for our internal moot court competition. What a great opportunity for a bunch of, uh, uh, you know, law students in Tucson that they wouldn't ordinarily have. Um, I was able to tap into former members of our ABA National Appellate Advocacy Competition team um, that um, to come and, and coach, you know, help me coach my team over the course of of the semester, that was a wonderful opportunity. And you can bring in subject matter experts, for example, if you have a problem that's on a particular um, substantive matter. Um, and then finally, you can get students comfortable. I mean, like Christine talked about, you can call, give individualized feedback on someone's oral argument. It takes a click of a button in Zoom, if you're doing your practice arguments in Zoom, uh, to record. And then you can use the type of technological tools that uh, Christine talked about uh, to give them very specific examples. I, I don't know if you've ever been sitting there madly writing during a student's oral argument and then also trying to ask questions and then also trying to you know, pretend like you're a real judge. Well, you can just sit back and take it in and then go back later and provide, oh, that thing that bothered me that I'm having trouble telling you about and you're not remembering, here it is, that facial expression. Um, 
you know, that mispronunciation, that whatever, um, you know, that, that slight misstatement or, or, or um, unfavorable framing of the law, um, that's right here and here's where you can find it. Um, so th that's kind of my big idea and the two sub big ideas. Um, number one, yay moot court and virtual moot court and, um, you know, also take advantage of the opportunities to enhance diversity and inclusion and to um, provide, take advantage of the technological um, opportunities. So that's my thing. All right, thanks, Susie. Um, any thoughts from our other panelists? We're, we're sort of um, coming toward the end. We got Leanne, but I wanna get a little bit because I think Susie, you really talked about sort of bringing a lot of these things together. So anybody have any um, thoughts on um, what, what, uh, what Susie was talking about with um, um, being an effective online advocate? I'm going to pop in just because I love this topic. Good. <laughs> Thank you, Tessa. But I think that it's, um, it's, it's kind of finding your, a, a different voice, right? So not everyone is going to be, um, a Paul Clement, you know, or, a uh, or, or name any of your noted oral advocates. And so it's, it's finding your voice that may be different in person and, and different online. But I, um, I appreciate Susie mentioning again what what David said about the equality and the size of boxes. It does really, you know, make us, um, you know, more more equal in terms of of presenting online. So I think it's a great way to think about it. And I do think it's it's teaching our students the wave of the future. Of it's not just, you know, even if we go back in person for most oral arguments, why would a firm pay to fly someone, or why would a client pay to fly someone across country for a 10 minute oral argument when it can be done remotely? Um, and even the savings for the environment of you know fewer business travel and uh, th there's just a lot of possibilities, so. I was also thinking, um, Susie, I, I loved your, your comments and I thought that, um, a lot of them apply to classroom environment as well. I mean, if you think about, uh, and, and you may have mentioned this, but kind of oral ad, ad, part of being in a classroom and in a seminar is when every time you're speaking, there's an element of oral ad, advocacy there. And I think you're really right. There is something equalizing about having everyone be the same size on the screen. I also have, um, you generally ask my students to have their video on, but I've, I've told them that if for whatever reason, if they're not feeling well, if there's some reason that, or if there's something going on behind the, the scene behind them, if there's some reason that they'll actually be more able to be present with the, the screen off, that that's an option. And I found they, they really only took advantage of it when there was really good reason for it. And I think that that's another thing. Like we don't, in life outside of, in the outside world, we don't normally have the opportunity to be present without also presenting ourselves physically, which if you're, if you're not feeling well, or, you know, that, that can actually be really difficult to do. Um, and so I think there's a little more flexibility there in, in, in how um, we present ourselves. And I think that can be a really positive thing. And Susie, I want to just mention, I've been teaching appellate advocacy online for about five years now. Um, I started this as an online class because we have multiple campuses and that way I could get enough students in my class, you know, to, to really have some robust oral arguments. But it became very clear to me that they needed some instruction on um, you know, how many of you have seen your students and you can only see them from like here up, right? Um, and, and then there are some laptops that actually have the camera way down at the bottom. So you're practically looking up their nose. Um, and, and so I wanted to give them some instruction on um, being able to effectively present online. And so they need to dress appropriately and then we go into some small groups where it's four students and they have to comment on each other. Um, do I have a good shot of you? Can I hear you fine? And do you know how to share something on your screen to be able to present? You know, because this isn't just in the courtroom. Um, we're going to be using online to work with our clients, to share documents, to be able to, um, uh, edit things, and so it's it's definitely um, a lawyering skill that needs to be um, uh, taught, and uh, so that they can get some feedback on that. 
so our last speaker tonight is on increasing access to legal work experiences through remote asynchronous externships. And that's an interesting concept of asynchronous externships. Leanne, is it Fuis? Yep, it's Fuis. Yes, Futh. thank you. Uh -huh. Excellent. I just want, I want to pronounce your name right. I think that's something really important, particularly in the online environment. Yeah. So yeah. thanks um, and jump right in. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. Thanks, Christine. Um, what a, a privilege to be part of this discussion. These are some fantastic ideas that everyone is sharing. Um, my big idea, as, uh, as Christine said, is to talk about how we can use remote asynchronous technology to increase access to extern externships and opportunities for students uh, to gain real world experience. And the chapter title in the book is uh, Blended Externships. Um, special thanks to Tessa and Tracy for all of their hard work on putting the books together, the book together, particularly through uh, COVID and everything they were dealing with. I have to imagine at a couple of points in time, it felt like herding cats, I'm sure. So um, I also want to acknowledge my co-author, Denise Roy. Denise Roy is um, on the faculty here with me at Mitchell Hamlin. Um, she is also our externship director, and um, she could not be here today, but uh, we it was very much a partnership in putting this chapter together. Uh, before I kind of get into this idea about using remote asynchronous externships to increase access to work experiences, I just want to um, provide a little background on both the perspective I bring to this as well as the perspective of Mitchell Hamlin, the law school that I'm at. Um, I am on the faculty. I teach in our doctrinal and skills courses. I teach in-person, online, and blended courses, externship courses, as well as others. The other hat that I wear at the law school is as the dean of our career and professional development office. And as you'll hear in a couple of places in my remarks, um, this remote uh, externships, blended externships program that we have at Mitchell Hamlin is very much a partnership between our academic programs and our career and professional development office. And there are some very intentional reasons for that. The other thing I'll say just by way of background is Mitchell Hamlin is um, prior to COVID was a school that was actually offering this program, this remote externships program. We, uh, we were the first school to receive a variance from the ABA to offer blended learning, learning where students were remote from our campus uh, for a good portion of the time. And they came to us um, in uh, during capstone weeks and prep weeks for really intensive in-person uh, learning. We've been doing that since 2015 and had a variance from the ABA too. And so when COVID happened, we had a lot of these things in place, but we also learned a lot of things during this process. Our blended learning students, just by way of background for you, and I suspect this is true of many of the students that you have in your schools, our blended students make up about 50% of our student population. Um, they are students who live all around the country. They are second career, third career students. They are juggling full-time jobs, families, uh, uh, significant professional commitments. Um, they are average age 40 and the age range uh, rolls right on up to 65, uh, 72. Um, we just have some really extraordinary students in the program. One of the things that makes them extraordinary is the experience that they bring to the profession as second and third career students, but they also come with some challenges that they're facing in the law school environment. As non-traditional students who are navigating work and family commitments, they might not have as many opportunities to participate in some of the things like law review or moot court or some of those traditional experiences that um, are really critical for helping students build their credibility, their skill set, um, and their resume, frankly, with employers. We do have students in that program who are participating in those extracurricular type activities, but many are unable to because of schedule reasons. And for them, 
um, this, the opportunity to do externships in a really flexible, remote, asynchronous way is really critical. It gives them that really critical legal experience. It helps facilitate connections to the legal field, particularly in their home communities. We're in St. Paul. They are all over the country. It is important to them to be able to make connections with employers outside of Minnesota in their home communities, not necessarily where we are in St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, we have students participating in this program who do remote externships in a couple different ways. Some of them are remote in the sense that they're remote from the law school, um, but local to the student. And some of them are remote in the sense that they are both remote from the law school and also remote from the student, which has become a more um, comfortable and common thing for all of us over the last 18 months or so. Uh, the, this, the flexibility of this program, and that's really the key if you, went, um, if you have an opportunity to read the chapter. It's all about flexibility. It's about flexibility and helping students plan for these externships early, being really creative and thoughtful about the kind of placement sites they can do their externships at, whether it is at a law firm that they have just been, been introduced to, or whether it's inside the organization that they already work. Um, being flexible in terms of how we operate as an institution inside of the law school. One of the benefits that this program has had is that it has really brought uh, many different uh, function functions within the law school together. I mentioned at the outset that this is a partnership between our academic programs and our career and professional development office and other uh, uh, portions of the law school, including IT and multimedia. Our Career and Professional Development Office has a particular role in this program in that we help advise the students and counsel the students on the kind of externship placements that they might be interested in. And we also uh, do the outreach to the employers who are they are uh, anticipating working with or the, the placement sites that they're anticipating working with. And we vet those externship experiences. We make sure the placement sites understand the ABA and school guidelines, that they're expectations match the students. That's helpful in the externship process. It's also really helpful for us as a career and professional development office because we are making contacts with what will be a whole network of prospective employers. Um, we do have a remote asynchronous course. Somebody mentioned before in the prior panel that the learning management system is critical and I would thoroughly agree with that here. The course is organized into modules so that students can connect with the course um, in sort of the sequence that their externship starts. A, their one particular student's placement might start at the beginning of the summer, and another student's placement might not need them to start until a third of the way through the summer, for example. And so they can engage with the course because of the remote asynchronous format and the modular design when their particular work placement is ready, um, ready to begin. Um, the course is also organized into modules so that there are three different versions of it, a fall, spring and summer version, and all of the versions are different. We have many students in our program who do externships, multiple externships while they're with us, and some of them even do them year round. And so we've structured the course in such a way that they can engage with it and they can do so and have different learning experiences each time, even if they are doing an externship in the fall, another one in the spring and another one in the summer, the curriculum is different and it corresponds to their work experience. So I'll leave it, I'll leave it there. There are a lot of other details about how we vet and how we um, uh, work with the employers and work with the students and utilize adjunct faculty as well. Um, it's been a really interesting uh, program for us to, to um, launch. And as I said, it started before COVID, but there have been many things throughout this process um, in the last 18 months that have really enhanced our understanding of what, what students need in this regard. So thanks for the opportunity to share the idea. Hey, Leanne, can you um, expand a little bit? I get the um, asynchronous class piece that goes along with the externship experience. But is the actual work, the legal work that they're doing, is that also asynchronous? The legal work that they're doing is um, it with their placement is 
live, right? They're do it might be remote from the placement, but they are doing it live with the placement. So we have students who are, um, uh, you know, whether they are in person or remoting in with the placement, they are attending hearings, they are doing legal research, just in the same way that other externship students uh, might be engaging with more traditional format externships. But the the seminar component of it is remote, and the ability for the students to either work remotely or in person person with their placements is um, where the critical piece of flexibility is needed. It's a great question. I, I love that idea. Um, we have a lot of evening students and weekend students that work full time during the week. And so the idea of uh, how COVID-19 has sort of opened up a whole bunch of new opportunities for us is so interesting. I had a, a extern in Chicago and she's working in a compliance type um, environment, but she's really interested in family law as well. And so I was able to um, connect her up with the, um, the link to go into the family law trials and watch some family law trials, which we would never have been able to do, you know, before uh, COVID. So it's, it's given us a lot of very, very interesting opportunities. Yeah, absolutely. So, Last thoughts from anybody else? Emma, Melina, Susie? Then I think we're going to give y'all the gift of time and actually finish up a little bit early. Um, Tessa, you wanna take it? Actually, I'm gonna turn it over to Tracy, Tracy. who, um, if our panelists from the last panel want to go ahead and turn off their videos, we have some closing remarks and I'll, I'll let Tracy introduce our last speaker. Thanks everybody. So it is, it is my uh, profound pleasure to introduce um, my friend, Patricia Salkin. Um, Patty started out, um, I don't know how many years ago, seven, eight years ago as the Dean at uh, Toro Law Center. Um, and her extraordinary um, skills and abilities quickly got the notice of main campus where they snapped her up and she is now the um, provost. And so we have our own advocate <laughs> in the on main campus um, in the form of our former dean and colleague Patricia Salkin. Um, uh, when Patty was the dean, she was really instrumental in moving us forward in online education and in smoothing the way for us through resources and encouragement um, to try new things. And um, she was especially supportive of innovation um, on the faculty and continues to support us from the from the main campus. Um, so I'm delighted to introduce Patricia Salkin to share with us her closing remarks. So, uh, thank you, Tracy, and, and congratulations to you and, and Tesla for pulling this all together and pulling the book uh, together. I can't wait to see it actually uh, in print. I recognize that uh, we lost a lot of people during the day, but this conference has just been a wow. And I know that everybody wants to get to dinner and other things, but let me just see if I could wrap up uh, some of what we talked about today. First, I just wanna say that Churro is really proud to join Arizona in sponsoring uh, today's program. And as uh, Tracy said, this is something that has really been a, uh, a pet interest of mine. And like Ann Nowak, uh, who said that she started teaching online more than a decade ago, um, I did as well. And um, I loved it then, and I love it even more today, and love it that more and more people are accepting of what people were naysayers about uh, more than a decade ago. So, uh, you know, the whole concept of lawn technology has always been forefront in my mind. And as Tracy said, I had the opportunity when I got to be the Dean for that uh, too short period of time to, to really try to um, put my effort and energy where my heart was and where I really believed that the future was going. And maybe I learned it from decades ago when my kids were even in late elementary school. And I would say, you wanna call your friends for a play date? We don't call, we text. 
right? And so all of a sudden the communication platforms were changing and I couldn't understand it then, um, but of course we've all caught up to that now. When social media first started to explode, you know, I'm a land use lawyer, a state and local government uh, lawyer. I co-authored a book uh, with an attorney in Chicago for the American Bar Association on ethics and social media for municipal lawyers. Because when we communicate in a different fora, as some people pointed out today, there are different rules of etiquette and there are different expectations and different standards. And we all have to be aware of that. There were so many great takeaways uh, from today, including a lot of gems on pedagogy and great points about skills and awareness that our graduates need for practice. We started with a panel on the future of the profession. And while nobody has a crystal ball, it was clear that we should be prepared to be in-person, remote, and hybrid. And remember, we, we didn't really talk a lot about this today, but there's been a lot of pushback about teaching in the hybrid uh, format. But all of this means that uh, we have to be able to work with colleagues, with clients, with courts, with witnesses, with juries, and with others in all kinds of modalities. And we may not be able to be the ones individually to call the shots on what that modality is going to be. There was a lot of discussion today about students and their use of technology. And I think that most of the students have long been ahead of us, except I agree that we also have to be mindful about equity issues that many people raise today. Another lens that um, through which I have thought about technology, and I don't think really mentioned uh, specifically today, but apparent in some of the discussion, is how technology enables and in some cases invites or even demands something called the gamification of education. Our students wanna be entertained and it's no longer entertained by the sage on the stage. It's no longer entertained by telling a joke um, or trying to make some comparison at the beginning of class to the weather or something in current events. They uh, have a different brain wired differently and they wanna use their hands. They wanna use their minds. They wanna use their eyes. They wanna see things. They wanna hear things. They wanna touch things. It's not the same way as it used to be in the classrooms that many of us um, were in ourselves. And from an equity issue, as we're thinking about technology, let's not forget about what I think I heard some of you start to demonstrate in the later panels, but we really need to be using open educational resources to replace casebooks. And I'm speaking about this as an author of a casebook that is way too expensive for, uh, in my opinion, for students to have to buy um, but the material is all there. We have to create a movement. And I think that this is the group to do it, to start to create um, the open educational resources. I don't even wanna call it a case book because I don't wanna suggest that it has to be published by one of the commercial publishers per se, even though I know that we have a book today that's been uh, published by one, but we have to think about ways to reduce the cost of legal education Technology can help us in this particular regard with respect to what materials we require our students to purchase, because quite frankly, listening and seeing all the things that everybody is doing in their classroom, there's a boatload that we can do without the students having to spend um, an extra penny on additional resources. And uh, technology and boundaries, another theme that came up today. Um, this was an interesting discussion and it flowed through a, a number of different panels. And I see it also in a different way. I teach land use every year. And one of the things that I discuss with the students is, okay, so nobody wants to live near a cell tower, but nobody wants drop calls and everybody wants access to their landline, which the landline is now the cell phone um, all of the time. We need to check our own expectations and this is societal. I don't think that this is just within the legal profession, but we have to uh, check our own expectations with respect to quick replies in the technology age. Um, if we wanna turn off our phones, if we wanna not have our email go to our phone so it doesn't beep uh, when we're on vacation or when we're uh, off hours and particularly on the weekends, 
then uh, we have to create that environment again within the profession and the expectations. People talked about burnout. Um, burnout is not just prevalent in the legal profession, and we've been talking about it long before uh, COVID and even technology. But I think with the legal profession, as I was listening to everybody speak, you know, we chose this profession or we had a calling to this profession. It's stressful because of our duty to our clients and our passion for justice, and quite frankly, our nature of wanting to win. And so in order to do that, we're always putting ourselves out more than 100% for whatever we do. And that contributes to burnout as well. We have to discuss two other items uh, as today, I think the speakers have demonstrated the utility and the quality of how we can use technology for pedagogy and practice. First, we have to think about accreditation limits on the number of asynchronous credits that students can earn either for their JD degree or let's make it equitable. What about all of the foreign lawyers who wanna take a bar exam in the United States we have to enable them to take advantage of the online platforms as well. And all of our accreditors, uh, meaning not just the ABA, but in some states as well, um, don't enable and have not yet bought into um, fully what we can do. The few variances aside, it still is not uh, mainstream. And the second, uh, and those of you who know me uh, probably expect this, the bar exam. Um, I think we need to come up with a better way of licensing lawyers that takes into account more robustly than we do now the skills that lawyers need to be effective, and that includes uh, competencies with technology and communication skills beyond uh, simply the writing. And I don't mean to say that the writing isn't important, it's critically important, but as we heard today, there's a lot more uh, in communication skills. So I think today's program proved that what was once doubted and thought impossible is not only possible, but some of us on this webinar today believe that it may be superior to the conventional thought and experiences in legal education. So in conclusion, I wanna thank you all again for sharing your best practices, your experiments and your future plans. I wanna thank you to our colleagues who spent the better part of the day soaking up the great information. We've learned a lot and we're not yet done. Lawyers are leaders and innovators as somebody said earlier, and that's what we're doing in pedagogy and in practice. And one of my uh, sheroes, the first woman to be admitted to the bar in New York, Kate Stoneman, who had to go to the legislature to get the law changed in order to be admitted. She said, you have to take your opportunities when they come and there are always opportunities and I think that's what everybody did on this call with the, if there was any silver lining to COVID besides many of us getting more family time, I think it was the ability to accelerate uh, this change in legal education. So I look forward to law teaching strategies for a new era beyond the classroom, beyond the physical classroom 2.0, even though 1.0 is about to hit the shelves or should I say the Amazon carts. Technology changes fast. Thank you all, and I look forward to, to learning from you in the future. Thank you so much for being here, Patty. I know how busy we all are, but especially how busy you are. And um, I always appreciate hearing your thoughts about where we're going in the future. So um, I think that wraps us up. Tessa, you wanna come back? Sure, I'm back. <laughs> So um, from me, I'll tell everybody, thank you so much. I cannot believe after the last year of working on this book that there were things about online education, ideas I hadn't heard yet. Um, and I just, I was scribbling furiously all day long. And so I am, um, I'm just, I'm, I'm so pleased that you could all be here. I sort of wondered, what are we actually gonna do with a conference? We've already got the book. And then the conference has been all, like when you get the book, you'll see that there are some of these ideas that are in the book, but this has been a whole new thing. This is, they're all new ideas um, that, in addition to the book. Yeah, this has been great. I just wanna um, tell folks that we will have videos of the panels up um, soon on the website. 
um, once I can get our media team to help me with that. And of course, the book will be out in about a month. I was reflecting back and, and I just looked at my email to be sure. It was in June of 2020 that I approached Kath about this book. It was, I think, in June or July that I talked to Tracy. And by early July, we had our call for proposals out. So, um, so authors, like you've been amazing to get this through in such a quick amount of time and um, have been so patient to work with us. So this is just a super exciting culmination of what has been a very, very fast year of work. And uh, I look forward to seeing the book too. It'll be nice to have it on my shelf so I don't have to keep going back to the final PDFs when I want to look something up. <laughs> I'm sure Tracy can, can agree with me on that. Yeah. But thank you all. And thank you to Brian Wilson and the team at Arizona too for running this Zoom. Um, I'm sure Brian knows now more about online law teaching than he ever wanted to know before. So <laughs> have a great uh, afternoon or evening, depending on where you are. And um, We'll see you all on Zoom shortly.